to um, to to remember. So it's good to know that information. Um, yeah. Or you know, any ticket you might come across out there. Totally. Um, so yeah, you know, I just have it in the back of my mind that there is an increased risk of VTE and MI and CVA in all patients using hormone therapies. The exception is for perimenopause and menopausal women, where oftentimes using hormone therapies can either maintain or decrease the risk of heart attack, stroke, and MI. So it doesn't apply to, um, people who are in perimenopause or menopause, uh, they should speak to their GP about that. Um, oftentimes hormone replacement is actually better for their health. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in terms of long-term outcomes, bone health, stroke, Alzheimer's, dementia, it probably has a positive effect on reducing the incidence of those. Um, that leads me into the question of ECGs. Yes. And this is this is the, the 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 best question I get asked. So, what ECG setting do I use, male or female? Um, now, if you are a subscriber to the uh, OMI philosophy of obstructive myocardial infarction, infarction sort of proposed by Steve Smith, then you know that it actually doesn't matter uh, what gender someone has because you're not looking for something that explicitly meets STEMI criteria. You are looking for ECG signs of acute ischemia, uh, which are related to, um, you know, thromboembolism. And so it's not just about plus two millimeters in these leads and plus one millimeter in that lead. It's are there any signs of MI that's come from an occlusion? However, we don't work in a futuristic utopian health system, uh, and certainly we can't get all cath labs activated based off. Um, what we would like that to be. So the female is more sensitive. You only need 1.5 millimeters of elevation in some leads as opposed to two in other leads uh, in, in male settings. So if in doubt, use the female setting, it's probably slightly more sensitive. Um, but be mindful of the fact that we have cardiac remodeling. And cardiac remodeling is what our heart does as we get older. Again, all the cells in our body are constantly being replaced and turned over. And over time, things model themselves in certain ways. So when someone has heart failure and we put them on heart failure medications, it assists with cardiac remodeling. And remodeling is literally the way the heart builds itself. It's the way it organizes the muscles in certain directions and shapes. And this bit's bulky and this bit's softer and thicker and... Um, Exposing the heart to hormones over a period of years causes cardiac remodeling. So if someone's been on testosterone for 20 years, you would use a male setting. If they've been on testosterone for 10 years, you'd probably use a male setting. Less than that, I have no idea, and we probably don't know. And even with remodeling, the heart still maintains some of its a lot of its original structure. There's only so much you can remodel. So the truth is I'm not sure. But certainly if someone had been on hormones for a long period of time, I would probably consider using the setting associated with that sex uh, of that hormone. And if I wasn't sure, I'd probably put it on the female setting for ECG. That's a quite good advice to me. Yeah. Cool. Um, which then comes to handing over at triage. So you get to triage and the triage nurse goes, oh yeah. And you go, hey, this is a 36 year old Ah, this is Brian, who's 36 years old. Brian is trans. So we really suck in healthcare when it comes to the male-female binary because most of our ambulance medical report sheets or patient healthcare records or medical records or whichever acronym your system wants to use is PCR, PHCR, MR. There's a tick box that says male or female. And maybe you're in a progressive service. It's got male, female, other. I know about you. I've never really liked the idea of being referred to as other. It's not very inclusive. doesn't make me feel good about myself. Yeah. Um, so in an ideal world, we would have a tick, a, a blank box that you could just write the gender in. Um, you know, I'd yeah. use like M for male, F for female, T for trans, I for intersex, NB for non-binary. 
Um, but that's confusing because part of those are physical sex and biological sex, and part of those are gender identity. So then the question is, do I want to make my medical records reflect someone's biological sex, physical sex characteristics, or do I want to make them reflect gender identity? Um, and this probably needs some thinking about how your system works and whether your system is primarily set up for research or it's set up for identifying patients. So depending on how your ambulance system works or your health system, oftentimes it's probably better to have, I mean, look, if, if you look at the best examples and the best clinics out there, for example, the sexual health services in some states, they have two boxes. They have one for biological sex and one for gender identity so that they know how to refer to people. And they also know what biological sex and physical sex characteristics they're collecting for research, for identification, for tests, for different you know, discriminations in different markers. Because unfortunately, we know that things like kidney function is calculated based off sex. Um, things like your ECG is calibrated based off sex. Your cardiac indices are calculated based off sex, the size of your aorta your airway pressures. I mean, so much of medicine in a hospital uses biological sex as a discriminator. Um, so it's important to know. So from that perspective, I'd probably be collecting data on biological sex and I'd have male, female, and intersex or non-binary. Mm -hmm. um, the question then becomes, how am I going to make sure that in communicating with patients and in handover, I make sure that this patient is respected and treated properly? Mm -hmm. So it means you got to be brave and you got to make an effort. And at the top of the case sheet, this patient uses male pronouns. This patient uses they, them pronouns. This patient's name is John. Um, you really got to be brave here and, and acknowledge that our current systems aren't designed to work well for these people. And and we know that there's old ladies who we pick up called like Bethilda Harrington or, you know, some old thing like that. And they want to be called Betty. And God help you if you call her Bethilda, like she'll smack you over the head with her handbags. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a whole bunch of patients out there whose legal names are not the names that they like to be called. Mm -hmm. Every day we go What's to people. Called Penny, her, her, her middle name. Exactly, exactly. Oh, everyone calls me Penny, even though Penny's my middle name. And we do, because it's just the right thing to do. Same principle applies to trans patients. They're not any different to any other patient where you call someone by the name that they want to be called. And you tell everyone else in the team, hey, handing over to the triage nurse, their name is, I don't know, Cedric Butler Smith. He prefers to be called John. And the triage nurse goes, okay, cool. Patient prefers to be called John just making sure that that's handed over to the team. Um, people sometimes struggle though, when someone is trans and they are using a pronoun, which isn't the sort of automatic default that you would use looking at them. So if I'm looking at someone and they're in the process of transitioning and they outwardly have a gender expression, which is male, but they're using they, them, or she, her pronouns, um, people often get quite stuck on this. And the easiest way to get around this is just to use someone's name every time you talk about them. Aiden is a 34 year old who we picked up off the street after uh, a um, MVA. Aiden was found lying in the street, partially conscious. Aiden had a GCS of 14. It, it just use their name. And you're not gonna you're not gonna get you know stuck using he or she or they. Alternatively, if you just start practicing they again and again, they were found this way, they were found that way, they had this vital sign. Um, it makes life easier. Um, it also uh, stops and, and and catches you from uh, making mistakes every now and again. Um, and it's a nice and inclusive way to talk about people. Yeah. I I think it's funny when you're having a conversation, the more that you practice something, the easier it becomes. So for anyone who is suddenly having conversations or using their pronouns, um, I think the more that you practice, 
the NPR becomes a confident in the situations uh, and talking to people because essentially we're all people. And, um, and do you know what? Every so often you might slip up uh, as as we all do, but as long as we all make an effort to uh, do the right thing, that uh, we will be happy that you do and they'll recognize that you are trying to do the right thing and if you the mistake that you're making and uh, most people are forgiving of that. A hundred percent. And certainly speaking to a lot of my trans colleagues and friends, you know, their parents still slip up years later sometimes, mm -hmm. but they are blessed to have parents who love them and affirm them and support them. And the yeah. parents go, oh, sorry. And and pe most of the time, you know, they, they move on and we just move on with the conversation. So when you slip up and you will slip up and you will accidentally misgender someone, and no, it's not ideal. And yes, we should try and do it as, as few times as possible. Apologize and move on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's about showing that person that we care about them and support them. Yeah, and that's exactly. how we sort of create that space of trust. You know, we, we create that trust as a health professional to a patient. I'm a safe person. You can talk to me. Um, and, and that's really key. So, you know, it's, it's something that's quite interesting because, um, there's a beautiful study by, um, by, uh, Lisa Kodakek. Um, I, I apologize. I'm getting her name wrong. Um, in, um, in the EMJ from uh, from 2018, and there's a there's a group in the states in the emergency department, and they did this brilliant study with hundreds of patients, and they asked hundreds of LGBTQIA patients, or in, in the paper they called them patients with diverse genders and sexualities, do you want your health professional to ask about your gender identity and sexual orientation? And then they asked the same question to the health professional: Do you think your patients? want you to ask about their gender identity and sexual orientation. And the vast majority of nurse practitioners and nurses and paramedics and uh, and, techni and technicians and doctors said, oh, no, 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 patients don't want us. That's private. We, we, we wouldn't ask about that. And then something like somewhere between 89 and 97% of patients with diverse genders and sexualities were like, yeah, yeah, we really want our health professional to ask about this. That is a massive statistic. Huge. And so they, they had to sort of take a step back and go, well, why? It's because it's a part of me. That's if, if you're a health professional who's trying to get to understand who I am to treat me, I need you to understand who I am. And the analogy I use for this is when I go to the doctor, I'm not an elite sports player. Not by any means. So when I get an MSK injury, I don't want to go through the most aggressive cutting edge program where I'm going to be doing hours of rehab a day because I'm not going to do it. I struggle to do the 10 minutes of physio I'm supposed to do once every day. But if I was an elite soccer player, I need my doctor to know that I'm an elite soccer player because he's going to treat me differently. And if I go to my orthopedic surgeon, I need her to know that I'm an elite soccer player and she's going to treat me differently. And so it's actually really important as health professionals that we know who our patients are. And it's important to our patients to know that we as health professionals understand them so that we can give them individualized care and see them as a whole person. The same way that when I go to work and I work with my colleagues, the way I build trust with my colleagues is by letting them into my life. I tell them about me. I'm going on holiday with my partner. Oh, my kid kept me up all night. Oh my God, I came downstairs and my daughter made a mess and there was Lego everywhere and I stepped on a piece of Lego and I almost died. You know, these are the, the little parts of life that we share with our work colleagues so that they get a sense of who we are. And who, who you are part of that is your gender identity and sexual orientation. And so it's important as health professionals that we are asking patients this. And there's a way to do it right and there's a way to do it wrong. The first is, you know, the, the example that the, the, um, the surveyed participants in the paper give is 
Uh, a curtain in a hospital is not actually a soundproof barrier. Shock, surprise. Who knew? Um, so asking well, someone in front of their... Exciting, but also when you're in that environment, it's just as paramedics, when you stand in the middle of the particular or no, and it's, you know, if you stand around, I'm going to ask super personal questions to you. Oh, sorry. In the middle of the day, you're going to take, take them somewhere discreet so that they can talk oh, about themselves. Um, it's, you know, it's... Exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and so for a young person, you know, someone between 11 to 12 and 15 years old, that means not, uh, and to be honest, any age, but particularly at that age, not asking these questions in front of their parents is kind of important. So it's common practice in medicine, something that we're not aware of in paramedicine, in medicine, in a GP setting or in a hospital setting, anyone probably over the age of 12 or 13, I will always ask to speak to them alone without their parents in the room. And I will say, hey, what would you like to tell me that you don't feel comfortable talking about in front of your parent? Or, you know, that's the time that I'm going to ask, are you having sex? Are you smoking? Are you drinking? Are you doing drugs? Do you feel safe? You know, are you in a relationship with someone else? Is that person a boy, a girl, or somewhere in between? Um, and the the HEADS protocol is something that we use in, in pediatrics. And that's probably something that paramedics can familiarize themselves with. The HEADS, it's home, education, eating, activities of daily life, um, school, sex, drugs and alcohol. And, and it's a nice acronym to sort of rem remind <laughs> you of all these things. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and and the way we tend to go through that is to start the question by saying, "Hey, you know, uh, some kids your age, um, uh, you know, take drugs. Do any of your friends take drugs?" Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, have they ever offered you some? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever done drugs with your friends? Yeah. Okay. No worries. What drugs have those been? As opposed to, do you do drugs? It's a very different way of approaching it. Um. So it's like, oh, you know, a lot of people your age are dating. Do you have any friends who are in relationships? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, uh, are you in a relationship as well? Oh, okay. Who are you in a relationship with? Not, is it a boy or a girl? 